Uh, thanks, Raf, and, and thanks, Sprout Summit. Uh, I guess when I was asked to uh, speak today, uh, one of the things that uh, I guess in the social impact uh, and, and social enterprise ecosystem uh, that we all need is support. And uh, you know, it's it's the the journey of a of a startup founder uh, is a tough one in no matter what market you're uh, trying to achieve your dreams and goals, but it's. Uh, even more uh, trying when you're trying to sell a social dividend rather than a financial return. So, um, so today I, I wanted to um, try and have a, a bit of a conversation around that. But I guess first of all, I'll start with uh, um, what is clearly a very busy slide. Uh, and unlike uh, uh, Richard, uh, who's been a, a headhunter and recruiter for uh, two decades, similar to myself, funnily enough. Um, I started in the, uh, I guess we could some, sometimes refer to this uh, capital markets world as the, the root of evil or the root of good, uh, as in when we talk about impact investment and responsible investment. So the first decade of my life, um, I had customers that included UBS, uh, McKinsey and Company, one of the global strategy firms. Um, and then here in Australia, the likes of Babcock and Brown, who were the biggest investment bank at the time before the GFC hit, uh, and Investec, uh, where I placed private equity folk. And, and even at Babcock and Brown, I placed their first renewable energy project finance guy here in Australia, who did all sorts of really cool carbon, um, uh, what's called CDMs in, in Indonesia in terms of reducing carbon emissions. Um, and that was a world where I, I was in London most of the time, just making lots of calls, and it was all about capital, and it was all about profitability of major corporations. Coming home, I, I started to sort of rethink where things were at. And so I came to a realisation after doing some work in commodity markets, I actually placed the head of carbon strategy for a power generator here in Australia. Simultaneously, I placed a, a, a what's called an ESG analyst in a family office here in Melbourne. And that was a guy that interviewed Al Gore when he came out here to release his generation fund. And this was my light bulb moment that there is uh, good capital out there uh, that can do great things. So fast forward a little while, I started doing a bit of stuff in, in, in not-for-profits and started mentoring a couple of youth. And that's where I learned to understand that the best uh, feeling and the best reward in life is through giving. Um, and I was mentoring and advising a lot of youth and, 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 and in particular one young chap. Uh, and it was just so rewarding. And then I just started to reflect, reflect on my own organisation that I'd started in, in recruitment uh, and ask myself, well, if I'm mentoring and coaching others, shouldn't I do for myself? Because we don't, we don't always know what we don't know. And so that's when I started to think about the non-executive director uh, market as, as a way in which to, to drive change. So uh, Future Directors Institute is about educating and empowering the next generation of directors, of which I'm co-founder, and also both NED, uh, which is New Economy Directors, and Startup Boardroom are the two advisory uh, companies that, that steer uh, sort of boardroom advisory for both startups uh, but also small listed companies ultimately focused on, on purpose driven leaders. And then my little billy card project is something called Entrepreneurs & Co which has a, a just building a, a, a essentially a, a community of, of social entrepreneurs but also really the, the startup founders and, and asking them their why um, to help them through uh, you know, really what is their mission and vision that they want to achieve other than just some new piece of tech. Now obviously that last slide was very busy. And we're all busy. We've got devices that are on 24-7, we've got emails, we've got social media. But sometimes we forget about the power of intuition and wisdom. And we can learn from those that have been there and done that. So I just wanted to play this little video if I can. Can we 
somehow let's actually let's see if uh, it's built into the normally if you just double click it it's all right Hopefully this will work. If we can get it up. Um, I guess in terms of the, interestingly, every minute we achieve 11 million pieces of information. And that's how busy our brains are and how much we're exposed to. Um, and we really have um, lost the power of this intuition and wisdom. And so, you know, for me on my journey, um, no joy, damn. Anyway, this, this is a, uh, an excerpt of a, uh, a, a film called Insai, which is Icelandic for intuition. And there's a couple of Harvard professors and uh, an Indian messiah um, and some, some really interesting people just talking about uh, intuition and wisdom and how we've really lost the power of that and it's really important to tap into it and it's even the the, the learnings that uh, that we're experiencing today in all our workplaces you know there's 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 well-being and corporate wellness uh, type uh, activities going on in organizations and we really need to to uh, to tap into that more often and I think with the regards to you know, when we seek out advisors and those that we can surround ourselves with, they can not only support us in our journey in regards to growth, access to investment, but most importantly, they can also support us in regards to resilience and understanding that, that things do fail. Things do get hard. And, you know, somewhere between 87 to 50% of startups fail, just depending on who you're talking to. And the, the journey is up and down, sideways. We've got, you know, anxiety goes up, risk of depression. We get imposter syndrome. Our social life heads downwards and the need for social support heads upwards. And ironically, I was in a co-working space. My social life was non-existent. So I created something called Entrepreneurs & Co so that I could have a monthly event with some of my friends that are founders and have a few drinks and hang out with my mates. So that was my way to get some of my social life back. Um, but most research suggests that 50% of startup founders suffer from mental health. Today or this morning, you're probably told to turn your phones off or turn them to silent. I'd actually like everyone to uh, turn them on or, or get them out. And I'm sure that each and every one of us know a social enterprise founder or we know some sort of impact leader. On Tuesday this week, hashtag World Mental Health Day came up on my Twitter feed and, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. So what we're going to do is for literally two minutes, we're going to phone that person and we're going to just simply check in and say, how are you getting on? And if you want to go one step further, please ask them if we can catch up for a coffee in the next couple of weeks. Because it's important that we support our social enterprise founders and those that are trying to achieve impact. And most of them are struggling. So literally, two minutes, let's phone a friend. Ideally, phone a founder. I'm going to do it too. If you get voicemail, just leave a message.
Dan, g'day, it's Was. How you doing, mate? Yeah, good. I just thought I'd give you a bell to check in. How's things going? It's good, good. Hey, uh, yeah, well, ho hopefully. Uh, it'd be, be good to catch up and just uh, uh, see how things are getting on. How, how you place next week? Okay, cool. All right. Well, I'll send you an email. We'll lock in a time. Okay, cool. Are uh, you you going to that? Okay, sweet. Well, well, let's catch up next week. Be good to see how you're doing. All right, good on you, mate. Cheers. Bye. All right. How do we go? Voice bar. Voice bar. Voice bar. See, we're all too busy. Um, but it really is important, you know, the, the, the social impact, social enterprise uh, ecosystem is, is a small one and it needs support. So we all need to support one another. And th this one's a, a worrying one. I can tell you if that's, th this is startups. As I said, social enterprises are selling heart. They're not selling financial returns, so it's harder to sell in as far as being able to scale, be able, being able to be successful and tell your story. So those numbers would most likely be higher. I'm just guessing, but I think we should all do that. And I just want you to ask one question. How can I help you? When you catch up with them for a coffee, how can I help you? It could be just simply, oh, we're recruiting a BDM. Do you know anyone who can sell? It could be, oh, I don't understand this Twitter thing or, or how, do I, how do I scale on Facey? You know, it could be anything. Um, it could be, oh, you work at that non-profit. Can you hook me up with the, the, the GM? It could be anything like that. So just ask them that one question. So what could your startup look like on steroids? For me, it was a journey when I started a, a recruitment firm, funnily enough, specialised in, uh, we're slightly different to Richard um, in that we were focused on because of my investment background, responsible investment, uh, carbon markets and, and pre-trading carbon when there was actually such a thing in the energy and, and carbon space, um, renewable energy project finance, all that sort of stuff. However, what we realised really early is that we wanted the power and influence of an advisory board. So, so we appointed uh, the likes of a, an AXA fund manager across Asia Pacific. Uh, he was also a Credit Suisse investment banker who'd done clean energy and renewable energy deals. Uh, we placed a, a private equity guy who'd done a $200 million IPO of a recruitment company onto the stock exchange. And we placed a CEO who was proven as a sustainability strategist at the same time, but he was also a very strong corporate governance director. Ultimately, that advisory board helped us on the journey. Uh, we had our own mental health challenges. Um, my co-founder had a few more than I did. Uh, to say that was, uh, um, that was just part of the journey. Uh, we also had national growing pains. Uh, we had six staff. Uh, you know, we won, you know, three-year deals for the likes of Deloitte and we were recruiting for the likes of Origin Energy and all these big companies. Um, and it was, it was challenging. However, um, that monthly, uh, what was initially advisory board meeting that then became a board of directors, uh, was, was resilient support, coach, mentoring, as well as connect, connecting us to investors and even, even connecting us to customers. Uh, just in, in, in two months from one customer referral, it was literally $90,000 in, in, in revenue. So that's what the power and influence of an advisory board can look like. So why would you want a board? Why? Why, why would you think about a board? Anyone got any ideas? Cultural knowledge gaps. Totally. I mean, when you think about the... Absolutely. Governance. 
Good work. Ensure we're running an ethical organisation. Could have potentially got B Corp quicker if we had a board, couldn't we, Rich? Um, accountability. accountability. Absolutely. Accountability is one that founders are often just doing, doing, doing. And we're not reflecting on what we're not doing. And we're not being accountable to ourselves. It's a big one. Um, but also resilience. That mental health challenge piece is a big part of the jigsaw. Um, and as, as founders, one day you're absolutely on cloud nine. You've just done a big deal. You've just ridden, you know, 4,000 kilometres and achieved this massive feat and the champagne's flowing. The next minute, the cows get on the road. You can't go anywhere and you're blocked. So that resilience and support is, is important. They also provide strategic foresight, unlock your blind spots, and they'll help you execute. We've all got to execute our plans, and that's what advisors can help us do. Who do you need on your board? That's a tough one. It's not something I can answer in 20 minutes. But ultimately, we need to think about what is the five-year hypothetical exit of this organisation? Regardless of whether we're going to do it for the love and we're going to do it for 10, 15 years, 20, whatever, we need to think about the hypothetical five-year exit. What does our organisation look like in terms of its products, its services, its people, um, the markets that we're in? Are we just doing it in Melbourne? Are we doing it in Victoria, Australia, APAC, Globe? What are we doing? Um, and how do you build your board? Again, um, really starting with that, that sort of five-year exit plan, working on a, a gaps need analysis of who's missing that can help us with the knowledge and the skills and the gaps to appoint those types of individuals as I just uh, went through my previous example. So it's not just startups that need advisory boards or boards, but it's even the likes of one of our big major banks. Obviously in the world of, of banking, they're experiencing a massive disruption right now. Uh, FinTech, blockchain, Bitcoin, um, Ethereum, all these different new platforms are coming to play, which can ultimately cut out the bank. It can cut out the interbank model, which is where they make their big fees in institutional banking. So even, even the likes of ANZ have appointed uh, you know, the US term, senior vice presidents, because that's all their titles are the big dogs. eBay um, out of New York, PayPal Silicon Valley, Twitter out of Singapore, and Di Dimension Data out of Sydney, one of the executives um, who's now actually gone internal. He's now the chief data officer of the bank. And that's an example of what the big guys are doing because of the complexity of this world that we're living in in this new economy, but also the likes of Atlassian which is the most successful startup that Australia's seen in recent times. Its current value cap is about $7 billion. But you can see Microsoft, Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, Symantec, the biggest antivirus company in the world, as well as Morgan Stanley, the top tier investment bank, Bain Capital, Accel, which is uh, Silicon Valley venture capitalists. Ask yourself two questions. Where are you now? Where do you want to be? What does the ideal exit look like? How much impact do you want to have? Do you want to have impact in, in Melbourne, Victoria, Australia, APAC, Globe? The character of your board is very important. Quite simply, we use the equip model. Emotional intelligence, which today is going one step further. It's actually called spiritual intelligence. So you've got the mindfulness thrown in there. Universal, to think global. Integrity goes without, without doubt, is absolutely critical. And the integrity piece comes with references. So you do need to do your reference checks to ensure they do what they say they, they will. And purpose, you want the values alignment. So you want to ask why are you interested in our organisation? Why are you aligned to our purpose? A while back, we built a powerhouse advisory board, $1.5 million HR tech company, wants to go into APAC or potentially the US. So we, we, we did the five year matrix model. We worked out they needed a number of different pieces of the jigsaw. There was seven criteria. 
but essentially we've got a tech advisor who'd founded and sold for undisclosed 10 millions, HR domain expert um, who, had, who was the Asia PAC uh, head, he's already brought in one of the biggest retailers in the, in the country to the, to the organisation, a marketing and CX person who um, digitised one of the global publishing houses and an investor who'd uh, done a $300 million IPO to Symantec um, and is one of the biggest family office uh, investment advisors in Australia. A co-founder built his advisory board himself. He had Australia, China, Malaysia, Indonesia, the US and India all in his advisory board. But what's missing? Three months. Boom. So S&P 500 company boards, if you've got more than three females on your board versus none, 36% greater return on equity. We've got to start talking economics when we come to the diversity debate. Yes, it's a social construct, but there's a bigger argument that is the economics. And I know we've got to wrap up, so advisors can help you with your seed or series A, uh, that's the, just a, a bigger investment, that's sort of more two to five mil in Australia. Um, international experience and global networks, customer acquisition, as I said, we had one that gave us $90,000 worth of revenue in two months. Steer through uncharted, in ch uncharted waters, uh, which as a founder you're always doing. Hire heavyweight champion employees, IP and business model advice, and of course, there's always going to be issues. Um, so, an advisory board can help you think global, and, and if you do get a chance, it's on Netflix, in Say, it is an awesome uh, doco slash film. It really does, um, if anyone's read The Power of Now, which I did, just read while I was on Byron, in Byron last week, um, but in Say, is just an absolutely awesome film to remember. Our wisdom and our intuition is one of our most powerful forces. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, queries? Oh, sorry. This is a bit of a, a curly one. Um, we've got more of an initiative that we're driving called Brighter Futures, and it's all around harnessing the um, assets within a community but also the service system and you know to affect positive change for young people that are in foster care. Um, so we're, we're at a bit of a turning point um, and a critical point at the moment where we've worked and built momentum around this vision and have a whole range of people both inside of government and agencies and in community that are wanting to get on board with that vision. Uh, but we're needing to transition to a new model and, and have brighter futures sort of emerge as a thing. Um, but part of um, what we stand for is not that it's collaboration over competition. Uh, we don't, I don't want to establish something that then competes with the agencies that are on board with us in, you know, in terms of driving what we're trying to drive. So I'm really challenged at the moment as to whether or not we try to establish ourselves as an entity from a governance perspective or whether we try to align with some other existing foundations um, or sort of peak bodies at a statewide level, you know, how we actually um, have brighter futures sustain um, mm. beyond the term of what at the moment, you know, it's actually emerged from a, a government initiative. And so we've got this cha um, challenge around, you know, eventually government initiatives uh, cease and the funding goes mm. with them. Um, and I certainly don't want to see all of the collective goodwill that we've built in the community and the service system sort of come to nothing. So I'm just interested in your comments given all of the startups you've done, because people are saying to me, are you going to stay, Meg, and establish this as, a, as an entity, you know, as a thing? Um, how, how do you make sure it doesn't, doesn't stop, you know? Um, and I'm really challenged by that, mm. personally and professionally at the moment. So any insights you've got? Well, I think that a point you touch to is that government funding can dry up. And we all know that whether it's state, federal, local, it absolutely can dry up, depending on different priorities. So I would uh, look, in, if, if you're seeking advisors to steer you through that, um, 
absolutely, you know, have some government experience, government folk around the table. Um, but ultimately, we all want to be self-sustaining. Uh, you know, as in, governments are going to play a role in policy setting and sometimes grants and, and, and access to funds. Um, I would be very much pivoting towards um, exploring options through philanthropy, corporate foundations, uh, the impact investment fraternity. Um, they're really, you know, there's a lot of focus right now around young people and youth um, to the point where um, even Morgan Stanley, I know I just showed a slide, but I hang out in that sort of world, and um, they report now that uh, there is a $11 trillion shift of wealth from the baby boomer to the millennial happening over the next 20 to 35 years. It's already starting, um, and, and to that point, uh, millennials have an 84% uh, appetite towards sustainable investing. So they really want to focus on social in enterprise and social impact. Um, and I think even that, you know, you know, the likes of small giants, um, which obviously have impact investment group, um, but even the big funds, HESTA, uh, CBUS, you know, I'd really be exploring those types of avenues. Social Ventures Australia, of course. Um, you know, because ultimately governments can change and will change, and they will with that change priorities. And we've already got an enormous debt problem in this country um, that's not going to be solved anytime soon. So it's only just going to be constantly pulled and pulled and pulled. But you're in a good space in terms of both education and youth. If it, if it was um, trees and environment under this current federal government, it'd be shut down pretty, pretty soon, unless things change. Uh, another quick one online, Julia. We have a question from Susie who asks, how have you found you can give back to your advisory board or have you found it has not been necessary? How have you found you can give back to your advisory board? When I first started our advisory board, um, the way we gave back was, uh, there's a cafe at 333 Collins Street called Strozzi. I'll give them a plug because they do do um, awesome brekkie and we just gave back by um, giving these guys um, breakfast once a month, every month and that was uh, what they got for six months and then they got 3% equity each and, and that, was their, that was our give back. Um, however, it's a, it's, a, it's a reciprocal relationship. Just like any mentor-mentee uh, relationship and as, as uh, one of our social impact uh, pioneers today will, will say, Jan Owen, if you don't have a mentor under the age of 30, then you're missing something. So the, the mentor-mentee relationship um, is, is a reciprocal one, and, and that's what you would expect with your board members. Um, in a startup, um, the board is holding you to account. However, interestingly, you're managing the board. So it's, it's a really interesting uh, relationship. Uh, when you realise you don't need an advisory board, I would always say uh, you probably don't need an advisory board when you've got um, a napkin um, with an idea on it and some, some squiggles and, and you've mapped out this idea and you've, you think you're going to go for it. You need to have at least jog, run, sprint, made some mistakes um, and that probably <coughs> realistically could be anywhere between 12 months and two years. That's probably when you need an advisory board. Uh, if things aren't working well, look, you've just got to constantly manage it, manage those relationships, and, and sometimes you will have to part with one or two of the advisors. It does happen. Um, but um, I think if you're in that, you know, you're determined enough, you want to go to that next level of, of uh, you know, be it profitability in the profitable world or that next level of impact in the impact world, then getting that support mechanism around you um, you know, it can be an informal advisory board in the first instance, and we all need support. It doesn't matter if it's customers, if hiring new staff, access to investors, governance, accountability for founders. We always need support as, as startup founders. So, 